Pan Mota case was not a legal prosecution. It was a fight between big interests and me. November 16, 1918. I was in the courtroom when the indictment was returned. Mail fraud. We insisted upon an immediate trial. The U.S. attorneys pleaded for a continuance. The judge thought that peculiar, but Anderson of the prosecuting staff said, Your Honor, we have not got sufficient evidence to go to trial on at this time. Over two and a half years trying to find something to use as evidence against me. They could not find anything. It was only about six weeks till Christmas. I told my attorney to compromise by offering a continuance until the first Monday in January, 1919. I had never been in trouble before and, and could not see how an innocent man could be convicted. In January, we were back as agreed and the prosecutors asked for still more time. Judge Morris said to select the jury and if there was no evidence, he would instruct the jury to bring a verdict of not guilty. Then Anderson of the prosecution jumped up and said, Your Honor, we dismiss the case. But that was not the end of it. As I said, the Pan Mota case was not a legal prosecution. It was a fight between big interest and me. We were building a people's company to turn out automobiles, trucks, and tractors. And we were growing by leaps and bounds. We had the most modern and up-to-date factory in America, exceptionally strong manufacturing and engineering and production, in the center of the breadbasket of the United States. International Harvester and General Motors and others feared our competition when they saw our products and what we were doing. Our stockholders were entitled to a 15% discount on any machine they bought from us. When our stock was all sold, we had approximately 200,000 boosters and buyers waiting for our products. In March 1919, they brought another mail fraud indictment in Chicago. This time against all the officers and directors, 13 in all. The trial started in October 1919. In the court of Judge Landis, Kenshaw Mountain Landis, a gentleman very fond of notoriety, find the Standard Oil Company $20 million and then later settled for two. Judge Landis had made the remark that he didn't need any evidence to convict Pandolfo. We pressed him for what line of proof they would undertake. One of the government's prosecutors said, we admit the Pan Motor Company has a modern and up-to-date plant, a good car and tractor, a fine drop forge, and that every dollar received had been used in accordance with its subscription contracts but we claim exaggerations and misstatements in some of its advertising and literature. Misstatements and exaggerations? We specialize in a four-page letterhead that shows pictures of the plant as already built and as planned to be completed, and we were in constant new construction on it. The language underneath those pictures is what they claim to be a gross misrepresentation. Aeroplane view of the pan plant. They asked me if I had put it through the mails. I said yes, millions of them. Then Judge Landis asked me, was this taken from an aeroplane? I said, no, Your Honor. Do you mean to tell this court that this picture was not taken from an aeroplane? I didn't know that an aeroplane view had to be made from an aeroplane any more than a bird's eye view had to be taken from the eye of a bird. In that kangaroo court, that was a serious example of mail fraud, even though nobody testified that he was deceived by it. Here's the next awful misstatement we made. We had developed a caterpillar type of tractor that resembled a war tank, pants tank tread tractor. Our advertising manager, Ben Forsyth, brought out a large broadside, playing up on this tractor, saying, pants tank tractor, the tractor that will win the war. That was a common slogan in 1917 and 18, Everybody understood what was meant by it. In the Saturday Evening Post, a two-page advertisement, Cigarettes will win the war. Mr. Herbert Hoover, Conservation of food will win the war. 
Mr. William McAdoo, Secretary of the Treasury, buying Liberty Bonds will win the war. But Judge Landis ruled as follows. The American Tobacco Company, Mr. McAdoo and Mr. Hoover are not on trial in this court, and their wrongdoing is no defense for you. He made it plain to the jury that I had violated the law. Next, after producing 250 of our Model 250 car, we were bringing out our Model A car. One day I called our production manager and asked him how soon we'd be turning out 10 completely finished Model A's per day. He said 60 days. I called in Forsyth. I told him to send out a piece of literature with that information. He did. Immediately after that literature had gone out, the War Industries Board commandeered all automobile materials for war needs. Therefore, in 60 days, we were not turning out 10 Model A's per day. We had no choice in the matter. I was confronted with that piece of literature. You put this through the mails? Yes. In 60 days, were you turning out 10 of these cars a day? No. No further questions. No further questions? We had promised to do something within 60 days, and it went through the mails. And it was a clean-cut violation because we had not been able to do it. The reason why, in our good faith, cut no figure. I was born in Macon, Mississippi on November 22nd, 1874. I grew up on a farm. After leaving college, I taught school two years in southeast Alabama. Then I went to Texas, and then to New Mexico where I taught two years. Then I sold insurance. I started the Pan Motor Company in New Mexico in the summer of 1916. I was the first man in the Southwest to use automobiles as a regular means of transportation. All over Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Used nearly all makes, or out many makes. I had a dream. I conceived of a car that would last and serve the people's needs. Had studied the designs of all types, had some very definite ideas of my own as to defects and improvements. A good car. The pan. That was my dream. I raised approximately $9,500,000, incorporated under Delaware laws, and built the plant at St. Cloud, Minnesota. St. Cloud was ideal, smack in the center of America's breadbasket. It was close to the iron range. Two main rail lines were already handy. The farmers and people of the area were natural mechanics who could be trained for factory work. St. Cloud was ideal. We had a marvelous time of it in St. Cloud. Wonderful people, just wonderful. On July 4th, 1917, we gave a huge barbecue. The biggest anybody would ever seen. 15,000 pounds of beef. Prepared by cooks we brought in from Texas and New Mexico. 8,000 loaves of bread. It was a tribute to the people of St. Cloud for helping build this company. During 1917 to 1919, I built Pantown on the Mississippi, 30 acres of homes. I spent 500,000 of my own money. I owned it. It was not just a promotion. I also built the Pan Motor Hotel to accommodate the unmarried, skilled employees that we were bringing in. I built and operated the Pandolfo Manufacturing Company, a sheet metal factory. I owned it and sold no stock to anybody. I made things for other manufacturers. Sheet metal parts for the Chalmers Tractor Company in Milwaukee, and some of my own products, which were sold all over the world. But my misfortune ruined me and everything I had. I believe the people of St. Cloud are the best judges. When I returned from Leavenworth Prison in October 1926, broke, in prison clothes, the Citizens Committee met me, accompanied by a brass band, and honored me that night at the Opera House. There wasn't a vacant seat or stand room even in the aisles, and even out into the street. I shall always appreciate that. People just don't meet a crook with a brass band. I was 44 years old when this happened, and I had kept my record clean and was sensitive about my conduct and my dealings. We had $113 million worth of orders for our cars and tractors at the time of the trial, over 66,000 in interest money. 
We also had over 400,000 of orders from other manufacturers for drop forgings. Chances are that if you took a 1919 Chevrolet motor apart today, you'd find the name Pan stamped on the connecting rods and the crankshaft. I were cleared but me. I was convicted because I was the principal and the rest of the organization could be expected to disintegrate. I was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment, the loss of all that I had, and the unjust stigma upon me for life. All for trying to be a good and useful citizen and building an enterprise. There are many people in the United States who think Pan Motor Company would have grown to the point that it would have outranked Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. Who knows? After the business was destroyed, the nucleus of our engineering and experimental departments built the first Chrysler cars. That same organization had previously built the first Chevrolet car. It was a great tragedy, a legal mockery. My dream was destroyed. But I've learned to bear it. I have. I have learned to live in the present and future instead of the past.